And let's start with a little bit of your background. Um, I will have stuff in the show notes, but let's hear it from your voice. So give the audience a bit of understanding of who Gary is and how he became who he became. What a big question, Adele. And thank you for this opportunity to meet you in Transition Clarity. It's interesting. My whole life has been about transition. Since I was very young, I was very interested in all kinds of otherworldly explorations that happened. I remember when I first started reading Hermann Hesse in my high school days and Siddhartha and the studying of Buddha and different lives that were beyond the ordinary. I was a champion springboard diver, gymnast, and track star in high school. I went to a very highfalutin, intellectually challenging high school in New York City called Horace Mann. And it's a small class of about 100 people. In that class, I received the award in my senior year of the one student who had the best combination of athletics on one hand and academics on the other. And that was a beginning of catapulting me in my life to marrying the physicality of the body, which I've always loved to express with the mind and the emotions and the creativity. When I was not accepted in medical school, after wanting to become a child psychologist, psychiatrist, I moved west to California, where in the early 70s, the human potential movement was just starting. And I fell into, with my love for physicality and the body, all kinds of body therapies. Mm -hmm. I had already studied psychodrama with J.L. Marino, Jacob Marino, who lived just an hour north of where I grew up in New York. So I was already interested in that type of connection with theater, emotion, transformation, breakthrough. And when I was in San Francisco and studied bioenergetics, deep tissue body therapy, sweetest massage, all kinds of emotional release work through the body, I became quite good at it at very in my early 20s. And so much so that what happened was instead of just freeing my physical body, out came all these emotions, sadness, grief, despair, I just came shaking and freeing to my body. And out came all of this pent up creativity. It was then that I decided in my early 20s in San Francisco that I would dedicate my life to transition clarity and transformation, basically, where I saw that we're all buried in our own landscapes of this body, our temple of communication, and that if set free and in releasing the physical tension, the emotional holding patterns and self-talk, then out comes the gifts of creativity. Yet it has to be by first releasing the physical, emotional, then the creative emerges and surges. I was creating paintings and songs and stories and poetry. I was so full of creativity in those early 20 years, my early 20s, that I basically said, I'm dedicating my life to, and the form of body work that I created was combining all of these wonderful forms where I found a way to deep stretch the muscles in the body while speaking in rhyme at the same time that the muscles are being stretched to take people on an instant whimsical vision quest and transport them to a whole new relationship with their body, their communication, their partnerships, their creativity, and their contribution to humanity. When I was 30, I moved to Hawaii and I came out, some people come out and they come out in a sexual way. I came out as a court jester with all this creativity and I began performing the living legends of the of creation myths of all the world's cultures 
in Hawaii with my jester's hat on, performing yeah. artists in the schools programs and helping people connect the children, particularly with their own legends by doing interactive theater. When I was 40, I moved back to San Francisco, was running a expressive arts therapy and body therapy program at a holistic health center and was sent as Sherrod La Charade, the jester, as my town, Mill Valley, north of San Francisco's personal jester to the Soviet Union on a peacemaking mission with my storytelling and my plays. Oh. And out came all of my creativity there when I came back, all my painting, I did so much more artwork. I found out only years later from my mom that my grandfather, was a clarinet player for the czar in Russia. And his cousin was an artist. They were trying to help me go a straight and narrow path, my mom and dad, and I couldn't do it. I, I, could, I could perform and present. I could be a great scholar. I could be a great athlete, but I couldn't fit into the formula like my dad being a CPA, uh, one of the most successful private char chartered public accountants in New York City ever. So in this path of me basically being this outlandish, wild, out-of-the-box character, I've now become, through all of these transitions, a specialist. Let's see, they hid from me that that was happening, that my roots were artistic. So they didn't want me to have an insecure career working with art. And guess what I do? I help free people's creative spirit for a living. I help free the physical tension, the emotional holding patterns and self-talk, and then through doing now improvisational work that's more focused with people who are entrepreneurs, people who have a message, but they don't know how to connect it with their heart, their guts, their body, their visual gestures, and they'll be able to connect and engage in a full body presence on stage, on the online stage, mostly these days. So that's a very short, not so short, <laughs> view of my life story moving from New York California, Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, Bali, and Thailand. And now I live on the East Coast of Australia on a mountaintop in a permaculture community. And I feel more connected to myself, to nature, to my own nature, to waterfall practices, and to people through this online stage than ever. Hello. Oh, and all I have to say is, thank goodness you didn't get into medical school. You know, looking back on it, you're so right. And realizing now that doctors have had to fit within a very conformed pharmaceutical push pill programs. I've never edited myself. Well, I've been always been authentic to myself and I live a life that nobody could duplicate, including me. I have no role models to follow. I'm a pioneer to take people into their own unknown. That's my passion. That's where I'm best at. Well, and you also think about the kids that you are helping in a, such a different way than being in a, in a box that they come and get dropped off. You talk for a half an hour, right? Like you're, you're in front of them and they're doing their creative arts and you're getting them to express who they are. And you can't get kids to talk if they don't want to talk but you can get them to move an arm or you can get them to kick a leg or you can get them Actually, to laugh. Actually, that's so right. You know, by having them move their arm and their leg, by being this wild character with my jester's hat and performing as I would be offering to them their own legends, their own folk tales, their own histories. And I would use everything in the room, dogs barking, people <laughs> coughing, people laughing, glass breaking as part of the stories. And it helped me develop my entrepreneurial, inspirational, improvisational way of bringing out people who are stuck in their own boxes with adults that now I'm mostly focusing on. Pe most adults that I meet are talking heads. They don't know how to communicate with their full bodied engagement, oh. interactive impact. And that's what I do. I show people how to do that. I help free these old holding patterns by taking a stand yeah. to those forces that oppress them, to using psychodramatic and processes, gestalt, things I've developed on my own, my own methods over the years. And it's I'm very swift 
and I'm very charismatic and very, uh, what's the word, clever and creative in helping people connect parts of themselves that they've been pushed down, feeling like I can't be heard, I can't be seen, I'm going to be, and this is what I do. First, I work on that deep pain, going back to the early moments, then we change the men memory by a new self-talk, it's safe to be heard, it's safe for me to be yeah. seen, it's safe for me to share my vision and message with you, with alignment from the verbal words, the vocal sounds and the visual delivery the three v's all aligned as one that's what i stand for that's what i practice that's who i am well and i'm glad that you brought up the talking heads because we met in networking and how many people don't even put their full face in the screen let alone exactly try to get heard and it's like okay can you move your screen so you're not cutting yourself off of the nose, right? And so you just wonder, like, how much they have suppressed themselves. And I also want to ask you, have you, did you, were you able to ask your parents why they didn't let you know about that other side? I understand well, they told me. the security thing. I understand all that, but it's like, you're denying half of me. <laughs> And I was always creating art. When from the earliest age, the first piece of art that I remember creating was when my mom's dad passed away. And I did some kind of a painting or a sketch in dedication to him. I must have been eight years old. I was always creating art. And I remember one day I brought home to my mom a piece of art that I loved creating. He said, Mom, look at this piece of art. I created and she was actually a very good talented artist herself and she said oh that's very good honey how's your math going how are your school how are your studies and i just said to myself this i'm not going to open up to her anymore um, and the my art was suppressed they basically it was a security thing yeah. upwardly mobile russian jewish parents new york city my father mm -hmm. didn't have any money when they started out and they really, they taught me, they gave me the best schooling, the best camps, the best education. However, I'm a bat out of hell. I could not fit in any box and that they, that they forced me to. This is how we brought you up, honey. We brought you up in this way. My first words in this life when my mom said, here, I'm going to show you how to work, were how to walk, were no, no self. I was going to walk by myself. My whole life's been about help people trust their inner authenticity, their inner core, their inner wisdom, because in a way, I had that mask. I was more of the talking head, too, when I was young, but I was wild and creative. Now I've been able to put it into a focused intention to help people from being just a talking head to connect the head, the heart, the body, the guts, the foundation in a catalytic way. And I'm just in love with this way of connecting with other human beings. It's, it's wonderful. And it wouldn't have happened without all the things that didn't happen along the way. <laughs> well, but it's also, it's also very, um, very interesting timing of it all, right? Because we are here on this earth as the chosen beings to shine our light like we've never shone before because there's no one else like us in our individualness to shine our light for us. So true. So we have to figure out how to shine our light the best way to be us because there's no one else to be us, right? And, and the world is shifting so much and so fast that sometimes you're just like, Am I even going straight? Like, I don't know. Where am I? Am I in my head? Like, right? And so... Well, it happened. Actually, it's a very significant moment that happened that I love sharing. And it's this. I was 20 years old. I had just graduated from Johns Hopkins University, an esteemed university. I didn't get into medical school. I thought I wanted to be a child psychiatrist. And one of the friends I met in my fraternity, my social fraternity, where I happened to be social chairman to, to make up for all the times <laughs> that I was just in a boys school in high school. I, I way more than made up for it by having the most wild creative parties, you know, that was there. So I met this man's father to ask him, he was a psychiatrist in Boston. I traveled up to Boston. 
about what to do in my transition, in my life transition, because I didn't know what to do with myself. And he interviewed me, not as a psychiatrist, as a friend of, 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 yeah. of his son. And he turned to me and he said, son, I have to tell you that who I see sitting in front of me, you've just presented all of your frustrated desires about becoming a doctor. And all I heard from you is your desire for security, money, prestige, position. Yet who I see in front of me is a very creative young man who had so much energy and innovation in you. The field of humanistic psychology is just starting off, 1973, just now. And I have a feeling if you honor your own wisdom, your own creativity, your own uniqueness, you will find your own path, not by fitting into other people's form, far better. Check out, and I did, the California Schools of Professional Psychology were just beginning in San Francisco. When I left his, his office, his home, I had such a feeling of yes in my body that I saw myself this is the first time I ever had this physical experience in my life. Mm -hmm. I felt myself, I heard myself walking through a tunnel, leaving his house, and I was shouting, yes, yes, yes. It was the first time that every cell in myself was singing, shouting, yes. And from that moment, I told my parents, mom and dad, I'm going to San Francisco. I'm going to check out the school. Mom cried for the first time and possibly the last time ever. She didn't cry very well. Um, because she knew I was leaving for good. I went to California. I checked out the California Schools of Professional Psychology. I didn't get in, but I met a man who was an astrology um, student and his brother was studying remedial massage in San Francisco. That's how I got into all of these body therapies. And I had to do it by finding my own way. And I'm way more than a talking head. You know, I've become a specialist in connecting spirit mind, emotions, yeah. and physicality with every being that I met that I meet. It doesn't have to be human. That's that's my passion for life is to bring life to greater life and greater connectivity. Well I get you. I understand the path. I totally understand the path. And it's and I think that's the biggest challenge we have right now just in general is that people are so busy doing they forgot to be being and they're not even in their bodies and it's like get in your body get you know connect to your cells like whatever's happening outside of us it's it's going to happen it's our choice to take responsibility for what we're doing right now moving forward what you say makes lots of sense i was brought up to be a human doing i was brought up to perform to present I was a very good, my father was also, he had the gift of theater and gift of gab, even though he was a CPA, chartered accountant, he had a great way with people. He could have written the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And in my own journey, it took me, I remember here in Australia, when I was in my 40s, I was in a training with core energetics, body psychotherapy, because I love this stuff. It's always been my passion. So I, I added this to the skill set. And in that, I was often confronted, hey, Gary, you know, you're a human doing. I was always busy in my, my fraternity days. My nickname was Squirrel because I was always <laughs> running around. How much can I do? And I was measuring my self worth from a deep core wound of not being enough inside, even that was not true, or more than enough, but that was a belief, by how many people I could help heal, how many paintings I could create, how much, how much, how, and it was, it actually exacerbated, exaggerated the same wound by doing too much. And it, it came through a number of breakdowns, my, my emotions again, this is now in my 40s, and then moving off grid, this is probably the most significant thing that's happened since being such a doing all these years. Since I moved off grid about two and a half years ago, and I'm I'm living in this permaculture community on the top of this mountain, two and a half hours from the nearest town, and I'm connecting through a Starlink uh, modem, and I'm able to connect really well online. I spent a lot of time 
alone. And now I have a new view of aloneness, all oneness, mm -hmm. same spelling, different sound. I spent time every day practicing. Ah, I, a e i o u. It couldn't be simpler. And that simple practice, I practice throughout the day, particularly in the waterfall and sitting in the sun, standing in the sun. It brings me into connection with the ability yeah. to receive inspiration, to rise up like all living beings towards the light, to express the I am presence. I am that I art. I like to say with the sound and intention going down the spine to the center of the molten earth and up to the heavens, taking a stand for what I, you, we am. Oh, the sound, oh, for honoring all circular processes of which we're a part and ooh, focusing on bringing sound and intention down to the earth. I trust what I stand on. So I connect intention, keywords, sounds, breath, movement, it, this has become my favorite practice and it couldn't be simpler. I'm much more interested now in being the human being that I am and the doing, it's not so interesting. At age 72, I've also turned more inwards and I'm happy to connect with fellow humans like this, yet frankly, I'm not interested in being entangled or being busy. The commotion with the hearing aid problem that I have with hearing as well, I'm not interested in being in loud environments anymore. I like the stillness, the yeah. quietness, the spaciousness, and I practice this when I help others in my body therapies and my work with them on stage and online to free their openness, their verticality, their ability to transcend limitations and move and transition to who they truly are. This is absolutely what drives me. And it's not by doing this anymore. It's about being this as never before. Wake, awake, open the door, remembering well, what we came here for. We are, we are talking the same language in different ways. Absolutely. Because How do you relate I, to what well, no, I'm saying. I'm saying the same thing. It's like, I'm here. My doors are open. If you're ready to get clarity in your transition, ready to transform, ready to turn your light on bright, like, yeah, we've all turned our dimmer switch on. and But it, now's the time to put that dimmer switch up, right? And I also use the lighthouse as a metaphor of you can keep hitting the rocks. That's your choice. But the lighthouse is here to help you. To say there's rocks, you don't have to keep hitting them. But you also got to take responsibility. And it's a choice that you only can do. We are here to help those who are wanting to step forward and move forward. If, you, if, if they're not ready, we can't do anything. We can't go, come on, you got to come do this. Or let's, you know. Right? Those days are over. We can't drag anyone in to do anything. It's a choice they have to make. Our doors, are, or I'll speak for me, my door is open when you open the other side. Mm, interesting. My way of relating to what you're saying is I've had many experiences throughout my adult life of meeting people who I know I could help mm -hmm. but weren't ready. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was doing a presentation. My signature presentation on stage is transforming your message with your body and your voice. Mm -hmm. And I was presenting to a group of a hundred people or more in Sydney at a convention. And one of the people in the audience came up after and said, God, you're so fluid on stage. You're so much fun to watch and you're so creative. I'm so frozen and stuck. Would you help me? So... I said, sure, of course, I'm happy to help. She came to have a session with me. And in the session, rather than focusing on, here's what you do with your hands, this is what you do with your voice, that's like putting Band-Aid on an open wound. I said, where have you been repressed, pushed back, held down, where you feel like you're not free to be fluid, flexible, and flowing in your communication? And she said, oh my goodness. And she started to cry. 
-hmm. when I was a little baby and I was just a year too old, my mom, my dad and my and my brother, they stripped me, they, they stripped me naked, they put me up on a billiard table and they shot billiard balls at me. I am terrified to stand up in front of people because I feel like I'm going to be attacked. Now she, the tears were water falling down her face. We got to the to the core wound and began to shift it towards the self-talk of it's safe for me to be heard. It's safe for me to be seen. It's safe to share my voice and message with you. However, she wasn't ready. And at the end of the session, in tears, she turned to me and she said, I thought I was coming for a presentation coaching session. And I said, excuse me, but I couldn't do better in getting to the place where you've been wounded, instead of putting a Band-Aid on an open moon and showing you the right moves to make, that would not be giving you my best and it would not be bringing out your best. We just got to the source of where you've been stuck and you well, can either take it or leave it. And she couldn't take it and I never saw her again. So some people are ready is, and you know, yeah. It, but the thing is, is luckily you did that because if you had just given her the techniques of how to, present on stage and do this and do that she's showing the whole world that this is how wounded she is and she'll be get eaten alive yeah right it, it's interesting you know some of the people who have not been ready have turned around as well i was in San, i was in uh, new zealand in my early 40s just before i moved to australia from mm -hmm. san francisco and i was doing a large presentation coaching workshop and one of the people in the workshop when I said, it's your turn, where are you stuck? Where are you held back? How are you afraid to express yourself in groups? And she said, I don't really want to do this. I'd, I'd rather hide behind that curtain. So I said, okay, yeah, go ahead, hide behind that curtain. Next, who's next? And she didn't like that. <laughs> she didn't like suddenly in the middle of her turn, she thought I was excluding her, but this was my strategy. Yeah. No one likes being held back. And so when she had permission to be held back, she went, hey, wait a minute. How about me? And she came out of the curtain and she began to open up and share what has been held back. About 15 years later, I was in a five rhythms movement meditation workshop on a Saturday. And I remember the exact room and I was meeting with a group of people on the break. And one person in that, a woman in that workshop somehow turned to me. I was using a different name. I was using my my Sufi name, Elijah, back then. So she didn't know me by my, my Gary Woolman name. And somehow it brought up that she came from New Zealand. And I don't know how the subject started, but she said, you know, one time I was in a workshop, a presentation coaching seminar in New Zealand. It was 15 years ago. And this guy named Gary, he came <laughs> over from the US and he, he led me to this exercise. He, I told him I was afraid. I didn't want to show up in front of people. I just wanted to hide behind the curtain. And I did. And I didn't like that. And I broke free. And now I'm teaching women how to speak and I'm traveling around. And this is what I do for a living. Oh my God. She and was ready, say, but I'm it was Gary? a slow fuse. <laughs> <laughs> she had to wait 15 years for me to reconnect with her out of the blue and you never know how you help people and there she turned around and said, i teach women how to present themselves on stage this is what i do for a living oh my goodness i help someone without even knowing about it we never know yeah. when person's ready well i mean like i know with my own stuff i'm i'm having a get together chat like hey how are you what's going on next thing you know kleenexes are coming out and i'm like what did I say? What's going on? What emotions coming up? Right? Because it's like I'm I'm just having a conversation. But obviously there's a chord that got struck. And you're like, okay, well, let's you know, unwind it, unravel it, right? And and see where we're gonna go from here. So and it's and fascinating. The, yeah, and that's the thing, right? Like that's why I love meeting people from around the world because we all have such diverse backgrounds, but yet at the core, fear, worthiness, like we all have it. It all shows up in certain ways, different ways. And we got to keep bringing it up so we can say, shadow, out of here. Let's go. It's true. And one of the ways that I have developed these creative 
ritualized process. A lot of that is in my book, Get Up, Stand Up for Your Life, and I have as an audio book as well. There's chapters on how to free yourself, but it's giving a person permission, I find, is easiest when they're doing something fun that they don't even realize what's going on with them. So I'll give you another example. Um, thinking, well, was like about to say one example, another one came up. I'll give you the one that came up and then we'll go back. I was working with a hotel in Singapore. I was doing a presentation coaching seminar for a the board of directors, basically the 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 executive management committee of the different departments at this hotel. And the man who hired me, Gerhard Kropp, I remember to this day, <clears throat> I came. And I was doing these exercises, turning them, oh, now I remember the other thing I was going to say, I'll come back in two minutes, into fun creative rituals. And they were at one moment, because I always ask the same question, where are you stuck? Where are you holding back from being able to be a better performer, presenter, and team player? And the subject came up, what do you do when someone in the hotel has a problem with a light bulb that can't be working in their room. Do you call engineering? Do you call housekeeping? What's the process? And so what we did in that moment, I remember to this day, Gerhard Kropp, who was the general manager of the whole hotel, he said, I want to be that bad. I want to be that awful uh, hotel uh, <laughs> um, um, guest. And I want to complain. And I want to have the experience of being on the other side. Hey, my light bulb's not working. I need help. I, do I speak to engineering or housekeeping or do I need a nurse? Help, help. And I got the different people involved. And it was so much a fun, interactive, creative, playful process that they all broke through because they were having such a good time reenacting different roles than the ones they're stuck on being. Now I'm going to share the message that I was going to share before I shifted my focus. One of the other ways that uh, tools that I've developed to help people break free from holding on to their familiar, smaller self mm -hmm. is this exercise. It's called the hero exercise. And this is what I do. I'll stand in front of a person and they say, gee, you know, I have all these wonderful people that I admire, Gandhi, um, Marcel Marceau and Golda Meir. They could they name three people. So, you know, that's interesting. But pick one. Pick one of your heroes or heroines that you revered, that they have certain qualities. You have pictures of them on your walls. You read yeah. books about them, but you haven't actually owned it yourself. And person goes, okay, well, let's, let's, um, let's do that. Let's do Gandhi. I say, great. Okay. So now we're going to have you. I do it with hands when I'm doing an online session. I say, have one hand talk to the other, but in standing in a room, I say, stand in front of this person and address them. Oh, I didn't realize you'd show up, Gandhi, in this exercise. This is great that you've joined us here today. Now, turn your body 180 degrees around, being in the body of that hero, the way they stand, the way they breathe, the way they move, the way they open their mouths, and in gratitude to thank you. What would it sound like? The person might say, thank you so much for honoring in me my commitment to being peaceful, no matter what's happening outside, to share wisdom and caring, even for those that have hurt me. I've learned to slow down and to be able to be in a calm state that helps my perpetrators and helps people in ways I fast and people I, I don't eat for weeks or months until people <laughs> stop fighting. I do these yeah. practices that, you know, imagine what Gandhi might say. Say, great, now come back to yourself. What did you notice that you did as Gandhi that you don't do? Oh, I spoke more slowly. I took time to be able to share my caring, my movements were slower, like that. I say, great, what are you going to remember from now on so you can bring out these qualities of caring, peacefulness, and passion? Whenever you speak, so I'm going to remember this exercise because it's as though Gandhi was right there. Mm -hmm. So now I've adapted the exercise that I ask people to pick three key words 
Mine are, I'm creative, I am. I'm inspirational, see this mm -hmm. gesture, and I'm transformational. So I encourage people to use those same gestures yeah. throughout their presentation, which brings them into the zone of igniting and augmenting their most fulfilling, fulfueling presence. So they're able to come from those qualities that were once disowned. So these are <clears throat> some of the tools that I've developed to help people come out of the box from their human doing this or their human smallingness and to step up, stand up, and basically share their wisdom, their warmth, their wonder, their whimsy, their wit, not necessarily in that order, yeah. in ways that are absolutely yeah. provocative, where audiences remember their messages and also are inspired to action. So these are tools that I've developed there, Adele, that help take people from being stuck to being in a resourceful state. Very simple so, practice. It's all about practice. <clears throat> um, how does that translate from a Zoom world to the stage world? Because I'm awesome. I'm not sure. I'm not I, sure your question. No, what, like what's I your said, question? Like, so talking on Zoom, I can talk to anybody. I'm good, right? Get up on stage, mm, not so much. I've done it. Um, I haven't. I haven't done stage since I've done Zoom because you know. Well, okay. Okay. Right? So how do you take <laughs> those same tools and and work with the? Because it's a different fear. Right. It's a, like talking to person, people or in a group on a Zoom or even a small group, you know, in a circle is totally different than being three feet above everyone sitting in chairs. Yes, it is and it isn't. There's different tools I've developed to help people in the online stage and the online platform, as mm -hmm. well as the live physical platform. In the online stage, some of the ways that I assist people, unlike yourself, who may be nervous and don't know how to use their body, most people don't, is like what I just was sharing a moment or two yeah. ago. With those three key words and gestures, I encourage people not to flail all over the place, that's distracting, to, to make clear word pictures, which slows a person down when you do that with your gestures, so people see what you're saying and a person's telling becomes compelling mm -hmm. i show ways of navigating the online stage to move from past present and future exactly like this to talk about the way things used to be the way things are and of the way things are headed to punctuate and choreograph key points so that if i'm talking about what happened in the past or a particular psychographic. If you're an entrepreneur, one of the things I want to tell you, I point to that corner. If you're just starting out in a business, that corner, if you have a physical activity or passion or hobby, but you don't know how to translate it, here's how this can apply to you. So I show people how to punctuate and choreograph their points, whether that's on the online stage or the physical stage, it's the same. When I coach, as I have many top national speakers, professional speakers on the stage, it's like this. When you share a particular story about your grandma or a time I had a breakdown and a breakthrough, walk to that spot on the stage, present that story as though it's happening in the moment, in first person, in present tense. So right. the mo the emotions are activated rather than talking about it. So here I am, I'm playing the guitar and whatever it is. And then you talk about something else. When I come back to talking about that story, what do I do? I, exactly. I walk back to that spot on the physical stage as well as the online Zoom stage. And I keep talking about, remember I was talking about earlier, I was playing the guitar and I had that breakdown where I froze and the card strings blew up and stay. Yeah. Well, here's now I deal with that. So when you move in the same spot and you choreograph the points in the same spot, the audience is trained to know what you're going to say before oh. you say it. So this is these are the ways that I help people on stage overcome the sense of what do I do with my hands, my body, choreographing, placing specific spots 
sacred spots on the estate that you return to because you've trained yourself. This is where this story belongs. This is where that story belongs. Let's go more deeply here. One time I was giving a presentation coaching at a National Speakers Association convention in Washington, D.C. It was shortly, let's see, some, so we're in the 90s. There was a woman who was a nurse in Vietnam that had to speak after lunch. And she had seen so many lives blown up in, in front of her that she, she found out that I was a presentation coach and that I work not just with the outer, but also with the inner. It's an inside job. And she said, <clears throat> I need some help here. I feel if I'm going to stand up on stage in front of these hundreds and thousands of people and I start sharing how people's lives were shattered and blown up in front of me, that I'm going to lose it. I'm going to wind up crying and I won't be able to talk. So here's what I share with her. It's a simple exercise that anyone can practice. Take one of your hands and place it at the base of your spine. While you're speaking, instead of directing your sound out, like you're trying to impress people or reach people out there, which is always so tension producing, direct the sound and the intention down and in to the center of your own spine towards the center of the molten earth. So you're receiving that message first, delivering. I was here in Vietnam and I saw so many lives that were blown up in front of me. It was awful sight. Instead of sending the sound out, sending it in like a lance mm -hmm. of heartfelt, fiery intention, to receive the message for yourself first. She practiced that. And it, she didn't lose her composure on stage because she was practicing this simple physical exercise. Talk to yourself first and people will get your message even better than trying so hard to impress people outwardly. So these are the tools that I use to help people overcome what to do on stage, whether it's the online stage or the physical where stagecraft becomes important. These are simple tools, easy to practice. Well, and I, I was just thinking like, who is the organizer that put her on after lunch to say those kind of crazy stories? It's just, you know, my old life, I would never put that kind of speaker on after lunch. Oh, right. <laughs> right, like it's like, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't think they knew. They they had no idea that she was more than a speaker. They often people who hire people to do speaking, they don't necessarily think that this person's engaging, and though you don't want to have a person be engaging after people are having ten or fifteen drinks at dinner because they're not going to participate. So you want to stage the timing. Yeah. yeah. And this is important for a speaker. The speaker deserves to take command of the stage, the kind of microphone that is used, whether it's one that has to be holding in their hand or one that can be, I prefer the kind that can just go around the head and there's the microphone here and I can, I'm free, I'm free to express myself fully. The command to organize how the seatings are in the room with the stage. There's all kinds of ways that a speaker, presenter can take charge of how the room is set up generally good to speak with the organizer beforehand to even go into the room or know about the physicality so in case things go off they can flow with it well, i remember I mean, even, one time like even in like many many moons ago i used to work for motivational speakers and i'd always say make it like a semicircle and they're like no we do it three and three no 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 curve the rows so it's more of a circle encompassing everyone's. That's right. Yeah, exactly. When it's more of a circle, there's more of an openness to communication. I personally, if I had the choice and I can do it with a group, I prefer a U-shaped seating arrangement yeah. with me standing here at the open part of the U and then selecting people from the audience to be on stage with me presenting and doing presentation breakthroughs. The circle is too difficult because then I have to no, turn it back. That's what I'm saying. Time. It's a, a U shape. Yeah. Semi-circle. Right? Yeah. Rather than yeah. like straight rows. And I'm like, that's right. The straight rows never work anyways. Cause then you can't see unless you're in the front row. Well, the straight rows actually purport and exaggerate 
the ways that we were trained in lectures when we were growing up to receive downloads of information like good little students and receive the information this way and it is never any real sense of interaction openness inclusiveness that's that's another way of looking at what happens now sometimes when you don't have control of what happens in the room a speaker has to take charge of what you can't predict one time i was about to share a moment ago i was in san diego california and i was presenting a master's class for professional speakers mm -hmm. and there was a large group of people in the room. And at one point, there was a smell of hair burning in the room. And what's going on? And I looked and it, I saw that the person who was videoing my presentation, his light bulb landed on someone's head who happened to be, as I turned out, a detective who wasn't there against us. He just happened to be a detective and his hair was burning in the back of the room. And so rather than feeling, oh my God, we have to stop, and then feeling cut off. I said, now that's one way of demonstrating electrifying presentations. And then people <laughs> burst into laughter. And you know, I used it as part of the show because instead of going, oh, I have to keep doing my presentation because ABC one, two, three, I can't get off my track. No, I include everything. Yeah. And then it becomes so much more engaging for everyone. <laughs> well, and that, and I think that's where um the seasoned speakers are right that remember that they were on the guitar story over on the left wing and they're on the dog story on the right wing and they keep walking the stage and keeping everyone engaged and and going and then there's other ones that aren't so seasoned that they hold the podium and the podium's rocking louder than they're talking and it's like okay well we're not we're not winning any people over here, right? <laughs> but it's but we all have to start somewhere, right? And and but I think what's the more interesting of what you're sharing is not only is it speaking, you're you're truly um articulating the acting process. Like you hear more. actors, you're you hear actors saying it's like you have to hit your mark. You have to be looking at, you know, they're going to have something dangling. Like we need you to look like there's something coming down from the sky when there's really not right. Because they have to do all their techno stuff behind the scenes to get that shot. And so you're saying like, you know, use the stage, remember your marks, re like, you know, on top of just, you know, engaging with the audience. And it's, um, yeah, like, I'm not an actor either, but I just find that that's the presence I'm getting is that not just a speech is coming out, you are presenting, performing, acting for your audience to keep them engaged, to keep them. Yeah, seen, yeah, that, right. Exactly. And in doing so, my whole way of speaking or teaching facilitating breakthroughs with speakers because i come from a background of transformational healing and body therapy and emotional release work that was the beginning of my journey before the skills of being able to be on stage began to grow from just practice and what i've noticed over the years is that it's an inside job it's not about presenting out it's about presenting in and as i develop this relationship to my own body my own messaging then what i say through osmosis is conveyed not by trying to reach out but by getting the message first receiving it first when i do that I'm not acting, I'm enacting from the deepest, most profound inner core. And then expressions like, my vulnerability mm -hmm. is my strength, mm -hmm. comes through with a softening of the voice tone, with a gentling of the emotions, with a more fluidity in the ways that the body moves. I often pick take SS people who are speakers and are not used to being in their body to practice the following statement. Say these words after me. The more I trust, the more I trust what I deeply know, what I deeply know, 
the more my thoughts, the more my thoughts, my words, my words, and my actions, and my actions, fully, freely flow. Fully, freely flow. And I'll have people sing it. The more I trust what I deeply know, the more my thoughts, words, and actions fully, freely flow. I ask people, this is one of my most powerful tools, to multi-sensorize their inner self-talk first before any words come out to an audience. I'll have them say the same sentence in gibberish to physicalize, to be more visceral in their presentation so the telling becomes compelling, welling, and swelling. So I'll do the same thing in gibberish. Let's say you have a pet dog or a pet cat or a pet bird or some other creature pointing to the four corners of the stage that <laughs> makes certain sounds. I remember my African gray parrot when she was alive, bless her beautiful soul, silver wing, she had her own words and not words, but her own sounds. She was, she didn't want to do English, but I would leave the room and we were really friendly and I never kept her locked up in the cage. I say, see you, silver wing, see you. And here's what she would do in return. The same sound, but it wasn't words. It's like, oh my goodness, she doesn't, she has the essence of sound. It was the essence of what was being conveyed. I was, I was saying that to give you an example. Yeah. Um, Refresh me what we're saying so I can come back on my track of thought. Well, Something about. But it's it, like you're saying. Oh, yeah, I got it. I got it. Gibberish, gibberish, right? So the, the, the dog, a cat, a bird, or other creature may make different sounds. So if I were to say the same sentence, let's say I'm using the sentence, which is another affirmation I have people practice before they say a word. It's easy for me. <laughs> Sorry, Let there be light. I, ha I have to laugh because maybe that room light didn't get changed. This was complaining. My light does that sometimes. We're having a good relationship. It's easy for me. <laughs> you see, we have to include the moment, right? It's easy for me to reach you with my message. So I'm going to do that in gibberish as though it were authentic from the point of view of the gestures, the sounds matching the words, yeah. but it's not the word. So, and then I speak from that place of being in the zone. So watch. So, you know, it sounds like gibberish. It sounds like Japanese or some other, some other language. Yet by doing that, I've had so much fun that my presence station, presence station becomes so much more fun to watch. People remember what I'm saying more. And I'm also in a very powerful resource state by practicing the self-talk first. This is what I encourage speakers to do. Then go right on stage like the horse at the gate. When you're in that zone, speak from that place. The doors open wide and the intuition flows through. Yeah. Well, so in my world, the light going out is spirits in the house. <laughs> right? So, it, yeah. But I mean, it, you know, like <clears throat> what I'm also hearing you say is whatever talk you're doing, whether it's on Zoom, on stage, or whatever, it's not for out there. If we know our truth and we speak our truth and we were grounded in our beingness, like whether you're using the hand on the tailbone or you're using the gibberish to get you all ready to go or whatever tool you're using, whatever you're speaking is your truth. Your truth is always right. Yeah. Right? I want to piggyback and, on that and, a bit as well. <clears throat> And the and the tools help just punctuate the truth. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The tools help to punctuate the truth. That's so true. You were talking about different tools, and I was suggesting the self-talk to get into the zone. Mm -hmm. Simple things. A lot of people on stage are too serious. So what do I do? Okay, let's do the monkey wobble exercise. We can even do this in the online stage. Take your shoulders, shrug them out, 
and make sounds of monkeys. <laughs> Baboons, <laughs> gorillas, <laughs> chimpanzees. <laughs> and by that time, people are having so much fun yeah. that their presence station similarly becomes invigorating, inspiring, nurturing, empowering for the audience when they shift their state. So for me, it's all about getting into the zone, then the words flow with ease, with grace. Instead of trying to get the words right, it's the relationship with the audience. I'll show you something else, another tool I've developed. Go like this with your hands and your elbows. Mm -hmm. Make a triangle. This is the shape of what I call the P formula. P for point, the points we make. E for the examples or stories we use mm -hmm. to multi-sensorize and demonstrate those points. One time I, a great example of that is. And A, the application, what's in it, let go of your hands now, from the audience's point of view. Yeah. Most speakers get so nervous about presenting that they make a list of all these linear points getting stuck in their head. Point one, point two, point three, oh, good outline. And they're, they're stuck in their brains. They're the talking head. When I encourage people to do presentations, I ask them to, instead of going point one, two, three, four, five, to go P1, E1, A1. Yeah. My next point, P2, E2, A2 and so on. And whenever you complete one point, multi-sensorized by an example story or metaphor, and then completed with an application, what's in it for me from the audience's point of view, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me, then let's move on to our next point. This P formula is very powerful in helping people connect their I am presence, their stories, with connecting with the audiences, the you, with the points or principles they make, the we. I plus you equals we, duh. So this is a simple huh. tool I love to share with speakers, anyone who's developing a message that realizes I can't just give points. It keeps me stuck in my head. I can't just give great examples. That keeps me in my own bubble full of myself and what I know. I have to also engage with and interact with the audience with ways that they can practice what I'm saying. Then the points become multi-sensorized, visceralized, as well as visualized and practice. Then we can move on to the next point. This is what I call the cycle of communication, the P formula. Well, and it's also helpful for if you want interaction with the audience that you don't go on to the next point until the act the audience has their questions answered, whatever, and you don't lose your flow because you know the next point is two or three or four, right? So you like you're able to engage easier. Um, <clears throat> so as we're coming up to the end, <laughs> this has been a fascinating hour. <laughs> and how what parting wisdom, not that you haven't given us lots of wisdom. How would you sum up, or I don't know, how would you want to close this off? Because <laughs> like, you you have all the tools, you have all the, oh, that was a good, you know, point. Well, I'll start by finishing by saying ways that people can connect with some of this wisdom in my YouTube channel. I believe you're going to put that in the- yeah, I'll have uh, all the that stuff in your notes. You have that information. Because yep. I would be very happy to engage with people personally. If you'd like to have a deeper dive, you can reach yep. me. You can have a 20, yep. 30 minute online connection and we can do, dive deeper. Yet in terms of, of actual wisdom that I would share that puts together everything that we've shared here so far, I'm just going to sit in silence for a moment and wait for something to percolate rather than quickly jump at the impulsivity of, of what comes. But just let me sit with, with that for a moment. And to ask out loud the question that you just asked me, which helps me connect with the engagement of the question, which is what parting wisdom can you share with us? Since you've shared so many tools so far, what would you want to leave us with today is what I heard you say. Mm -hmm. 
And what I'm moved to say, I often see words on the screen. So uh, the words that I'm seeing is the body, our body is our chief instrument of communication. Mm -hmm. And by giving deference, respect, connection to this place that we come from, when we say any word, then our thoughts, our words, and our actions are all in alignment, the verbal, vocal, visual elements of our delivery. When you speak, notice after you've seen and heard this presentation and this lovely interview, thank you for your engaging questions, Del, here today. Notice how you're now able to use your body to perceive, on the one hand, and express, on the other hand, in ways you never knew possible, to bring out nuances of you wants, to bring out more you more, more you, you more in everything that you think, say, and do. This is my key message to you. This is where it all begins from the inside out. It's an inside job. Yes. So agree. And I think you've given us so many tools, so many little innuendos to work with to just in, just even if if the listeners take what you've said today, their speaking engagements will be so different. Yeah. Right? right. And and um so yeah i want to thank you for being on the show today it was an it's awesome pleasure. authentic conversation and everything will be in the show notes beautiful wow what a great conversation with gary holman if you haven't picked up a few tips out of this conversation i don't know where you're going to um his energy his knowledge his way to speak is just wonderful and he has a lot more tips for you than we could fit in this conversation so once again grab everything from the notes and book a session with him you'll you'll just have a great time